Welcome, all pregnant families, midwives, or birth workers. This is Tracy Anderson Askew, your host for the Transform Your Birth podcast, changing your mind about birth one story at a time. Each week, we will be exploring a birth story through the lens of what birth can teach us. I'll be digging deep into each story so you can learn what it is that can change the way a birth unfolds. We can't control birth, but we can influence it. So listen in to find out how. Enjoy. In this episode, Chelsea talks about her preparation. She used chiropractic, acupuncture and a woman's health physio that all contributed to her pregnancy feeling more comfortable and the birth of her almost four and a half kilo baby. She had a well-prepared partner, a student midwife and another highly skilled midwife that supported the safe delivery of her baby. Chelsea's situation in second stage could have very easily ended in a caesarean. However, with her freedom to move and respond to what her body was telling her and some skilled hands of a midwife, she gets the baby out with only a minor tear. A very inspiring story to say the least and much wisdom shared. Absolutely worth a listen. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. Most of the stories you will hear through this podcast are graduates of the Transform Your Birth workshop held in Canberra. Our Transform Your Birth Today course is now available to anyone, anywhere, at any time and includes all the wonderful wisdom of this course and live weekly catch-ups when you need it with our host, Tracy. For a little taste, please accept our pregnancy gift offer, which can contains free, the first few lessons and some essential wisdom for pregnancy. The link can be found in these show notes or visit transformyourbirth.com.au. And now for the episode. Hello everyone, it's Tracy again with you this week and I have the lovely Chelsea talking about her birth and Chelsea had a whopper of a baby and she's not an overly big woman. (laughs) So um and we have a few little hints as to why she was able to manage that so beautifully, but we'll we'll get into the story. Thank you, Chelsea, for being here. No worries. Thanks for having me, Trace. I've been really looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so, Chelsea, tell us how you're feeling about your um, being pregnant. Were you nervous about birth or what was sort of how were you walking into this and then what sort of prep did you do? Um, I don't think I was, this might come across as a bit naive, but I don't think I was um, nervous at all during my pregnancy or leading up to it. And I don't think I've ever really felt too nervous about birth. It's probably got a lot to do with my mum because I've grown up in such like a birth positive household, yeah, if that right. is, is a way to put it. But I've just yeah. always heard nothing but like, you know, good good things about childbirth and I've always been raised in a really like, you know, I've been raised around a capable mum who's had five births and has always spoke so positively about it that I didn't really, I haven't had any fear sort of instilled in me about it. So, no, I wasn't nervous. Um, there was definitely like a few little things in my head like the what ifs and I think that's pretty natural and I sort of was thinking about, you know, the possible avenues it could have gone down but I don't, I didn't have any fear going into it which was really nice and I felt a bit excited at the prospect of it, maybe until a few contractions started, but leading up to it, I was feeling I was feeling really good. So yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. And what sort of prep did you do? Uh, I did a lot. So I um, straight off the bat, I sort of threw myself into trying to educate myself as much as I could. Sorry. <laughs> We, and, we, do, um, we normally have babies in the podcast, but today we've got a dash hound. <laughs> she didn't give birth to this dog. But it's decided it wants to be in front and centre. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. Um, because, yeah, straight away I really threw myself into the research side of things and I wanted to know exactly what I was getting myself into. So, God, I can't even... I can't even think of how many different podcasts I listen to. I listen to yours. I listen to Australian birth stories, the great birth rebellion, the midwife cauldron. Like I just immersed myself in everything, childbirth and labor and pregnancy and everything. And um, through that, I started uh, regular Cairo work. And what I do, I did Cairo from about 20 weeks. And then I sort of built it up to, 
um, I started doing monthly Cairo and then I started to do weekly Cairo getting closer to my birth. So you you did monthly Cairo. It's it's interesting you talk about that because I had a couple on uh, Chelsea, another Chelsea and Bilal who um, are both Cairo's and Chelsea was doing the same thing. What sort of difference did you think that made to your pregnancy and potentially your birth? Um, it hugely benefited my pregnancy, I think. Like I, um, I've got very mild scoliosis, so there was that that I was kind of mindful of as well. Yep, made a massive difference to my pregnancy, especially. I've got mild scoliosis, but like I don't think that's um, that's like it benefited. It would benefit otherwise. Yeah. But I, that was the main thing that sort of kind of got me thinking. Oh, I want to make sure I'm managing that. But I was so comfortable my whole pregnancy. I didn't have any hip pain, and it would start to flare. Like it would slowly start to build before an appointment. Yeah, and then after that, it would just completely ease off so I was really comfortable in my body and I didn't have any aches and pains and as I got closer towards my due date and I was so front heavy my I was having some issues with my pelvis and my spine and my rib cage were rotating opposite ways because of the the um curve and yeah if I hadn't been having Cairo I think I would have been in worlds of hurt where I was I was really comfortable and I think it massively contributed to birth, keeping myself all aligned and keeping him. He was in a minus, we'll get into it further, minus the hand positioning. He was in a great position yeah. for birth. And I think um, I think Cairo really benefited that given that my body wasn't going to cooperate or it wasn't going to probably do that too well on its own accord if I'd done nothing. Yeah. Wow. That's so that was we yeah. had Lynn Schultz also on the podcast and she's been a body worker and particularly specialised in this area. She's in America for over 20-odd years and she talked a lot about the importance of bodies being in balance. Yeah. And she believes that a big part of complexity in birth can be connected to that. So that's, yeah, that's interesting. And what other sort of um, preparation did you do? Um, I also did acupuncture, which I think started mm-hmm. around a similar time. I think or it might have been a little bit later. I think from about 20, 25 weeks I started acupuncture and that was also great because I same just little niggly things like, um, you know, the sides of your hips and your bum, that, actually that muscle pain, just, that was amazing. Actually, I got her, Holly, uh, Dr. Holly Brocklebank. Brockle, yeah. Brockle- yeah, which okay, I actually yeah. got your website. Yeah, yeah she was yeah. phenomenal. So I um, had regular acupuncture. I did that monthly as well until the last um, eight weeks, I think, and then it started. That became weekly as well. So I was just alternating between the two. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think that, but between the Cairo and the acupuncture, it really kept my body comfortable, mm-hmm. and I feel like I was I was in a good position in myself leading up to the first like I felt really good I was still really active I didn't have any aches and pains yeah so which is phenomenal because you were very large your belly was right out the front when I I, I saw you at full term (laughs) yeah I was a whopper yeah and um and I I think we have to appreciate particularly in this modern age because we sit down so much and we're not designed as humans to sit and babies being in not so good positions yeah. is becoming more common, and I think it's because of our lifestyle. Yeah. So, I um, think the little hint that Chelsea's given you there can be very helpful if you have really good um, practitioners. There's some who, for those in Canberra, you'll find some good names of people on my website on the resources page. But you'll find them all everywhere. These um, modalities are very, very powerful, and keeping your body in balance is very important and it isn't just getting body work too it's also the way you sit the way you lie not doing too much reclining in the end of your pregnancy these are all things that can support the good positioning of baby we can't control this but we can sometimes influence it and then Chelsea did the transform your birth course and I know your lovely Zach was blown away by that tell us about how you experienced (laughs) that um, getting on board that was a fantastic course, actually. And I think, yeah, it, it definitely, like, I'd, I'd already sort of thrown myself into it. So there was quite a few, um, like, the factual things that I knew, but I knew that he didn't. And it was so benef- beneficial for him as well. Like, we walked out of there and it was like, 
I'm so pumped. I'm ready to go. And we both felt like really elevated and um, confident in what we were doing. And I think the tools, you have a really big focus on um, the partner's role and the fact that they're not Mm. just useless and sitting there and ready to wait till the baby's born and that what they do can affect the experience of the mum so much. And I experienced that in my birth where I look back on it now and I think, oh, if he hadn't have supported me in the ways that you'd sort of explained, I would have had a, it would have been a rough time. Like it was rough anyway, but it would have been on a completely different level. Like I think those small things made such a big difference that, yeah, yeah, you don't, you don't really realise how much it actually contributes to the experience and to how it pans out as well. Yeah, absolutely. The, mm. the partner role is a very significant role and when we help partners to understand how they can be useful and in a very practical way but also helping them to understand where things can get tricky and overcoming problems yeah. like if she says she didn't want drugs and then she changes her mind how to deal with that, which can be very it was, hard. There was a very funny, that actually, um, that happened that happened towards the end and mm-hmm. I remember being in the bath and Zach saying, just just do two more contractions, two more contractions. And I was daggerizing him. And he's two more contractions. And then, you know, like then we'll try the gas. And I'm going, give me the gas. And I ended up apparently he goes, come on, I did one more. And then he goes, just one more. And I looked at my student midwife and I was like, give me the gas. And he goes, you bypassed me completely. And I knew, okay, she probably needs the gas. <laughs> <laughs> they you can get you can get very very tricky um can I ask you another question you did a lot of research and yep. that can be very fear provoking for some people because when our minds take in so much information we don't always know what to do with it and how to manage that yep. was it too much for you Chelsea or how did you process all of that information um I was really mindful of what information I was taking in right so I was um, – everything I was looking at was really – there was a reason behind it and I was very purposeful with what I was looking at and I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of delve into into things that would scare me or mm. um, within reason, of course. Like I was obviously wanted to know if things went south, what my options were with that, but I wouldn't um, – I wouldn't overindulge in it and sort of like go down the rabbit hole of – you know, it, it turns into a bit of a spiralling effect. Yeah, and I, exactly. I kind of tried to work out when to when to stop and go, okay, well, that's enough information in that area. If I look at this anymore, it's just going to start, you know. In your mind, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I was really trying to be really mindful of um, mm. what I was what I was looking at. Yeah, it is one of the biggest challenges that I think we have as women in this modern day is we have so much information accessible so yeah. easily and we are used to looking for things and answers to things. And when you get exposed to a lot of what can happen, what can happen, what can happen, without enough how do I deal with it, then Mm. that can really spin women into a state of overwhelm and stress. And, of course, we want to move away from the stress response and more towards confidence and understanding and calmness and those sorts of feelings. So yeah. and this extends also into parenting. In fact, it's probably even more powerful in parenting because once again, we look outside of ourselves for answers before we dig deeper. And because of that, I've noticed with new mums, it can take them a lot longer to get confident because they're so used to Googling everything. They're not relying yeah. on some of their inner intuitions and and attunement to the baby and the connections that they're experiencing each and every day. And they're using yeah. different parts of their brain. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. But I'll um, quickly add on to that, although I am jumping yeah. the gun a little bit. But it's funny you mention that because after he was born, everyone recommends all these apps and yeah. things and, yeah. like, you know, the feed trackers and the, the sleep trackers and everything like that. And I sort of fell into that and had had one of those apps for maybe the first three or four nights. Yeah. And so I ended up actually just saying, just delete it because it's consuming your head if he's, you know, like you'll you'll you know him better than the app knows him. You're not, you know, like it's yeah. not the app's not going to be accurate for every baby. And then it just mm. becomes all consuming and overwhelming. I think a lot of people fall into that too. So delete yeah. the apps, they're no good. 
<laughs> delete the apps, people, delete the apps. Well, people often ask me, you know, what about those tracking contraction apps? And I said, look, if that floats your boat, by all means, but if it starts to say to you, and now is the time to go to the hospital, forget it. Like you've got to tune yeah. in that, that yeah. you know, you cannot be guided by an app under any yeah. circumstances. But anyway, I'm sure they have their place. Yeah. So darling, it's tell us now, tell us about how it unfolded for you. Yep. Oh, I've missed a little bit. Sure, go. Um, what do you want I mean, to share? I forgot to, I forgot to mention that I um I also saw a pelvic floor physio. Ah, yes. And that, please. Yeah, yeah. Tell me more um, about and that. And that made a, a huge, huge difference. I could not recommend it more. Um, I'd never, I'd never been really someone that does my kegels or knows much about my pelvic floor or is really that in tuned. Um. But I did go and see a pelvic floor specialist purely from the start. I just wanted it to be assessed and to know whether I was going to be at risk of prolapse or anything like that. Yeah. And then that kind of um, snowballed into having regular appointments with her and we did a lot of um, like de-armoring and internal release work and um, massage and everything like that, perineal massage. And yeah. once we get into it and we hear about how he came out and the size of this kid, that whole, I think that contributed hugely to to the severity of my um, trauma. Yeah, awesome. So that yeah, that was I could not have um, could not recommend doing that more. Mm-hmm. Even just having the knowledge of what's going on, um, mm-hmm. I had a really overactive pelvic floor. So had I gone and done more Kegels or or exercises and made it tighter, it would have been worse, and it, mm-hmm. it would have been even harder to push him out. So, yeah, her being able to recognise that and then my focus just being relaxation and relaxing my pelvic floor mm. and learning all my deep breathing was really important. I wouldn't have known that otherwise. Yeah. So that was, was really good knowledge to to get. You've given some great information on this, Chelsea. I think the um, uh, getting a, a pelvic floor physio prior to the birth and doing a baseline measurement of where you're at and what's actually going on for you because you're right we hear all these you know pelvic floor exercises but for some women that's not actually that's going to make, no, that would make, worse. make yeah. things worse yeah so um and what's really good if they've got a baseline measurement then on your recovery side of things and you go and get checked again they can help you to understand what sort of um functioning to reclaim and retain because what tends to happen and I had a wonderful um, physio explain this to me beautifully um, here in Canberra Katie um, spelled and wine she talked about over time with each baby that you might have your pelvic functioning gets less and less and then you get to my age I'm in my mid to late 50s um that's when you can experience things like incontinence and yeah. um, prolapses and things like that as you get older. Whereas if you can reclaim that level of functioning after each baby, that's going to make a big difference later down the track. So, yeah, that's great, great information. Yeah. Thanks for popping yeah. that in. Okay, that's so all right. tell <laughs> us about the um, how it unfolded for you. How it unfolded. Well, I... What was it? I was 39 and six days when I went into labor and it was early, early on a Monday morning. Zach was just leaving for work and I went to the toilet and I was thinking, this baby's not going to come yet. He's going to be late. I'm always <laughs> late. And um, <laughs> and sat down on the toilet and I lost my mucus plug and I was like, oh. I knew that wasn't always at the start of labour, but I thought, oh, that's like, that was the first sign that I'd had. There'd been no symptoms prior, mm-hmm. no indication that he was coming. So that's why I'd sort of, I tried really tried to put it to the back of my head so that I wasn't, it wasn't on my mind all day, every day, although it was regardless. Um, so I thought, okay, great. I've lost my mucus plug. That's some sort of indication. And within an hour of that happening, I had my first small, like early contraction and Zach had left for work and I was just pottering along thinking, okay, okay, maybe it's just a Braxton Hicks. I'd had a few like really good Braxton Hicks a couple of weeks leading up to this. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I kind of let it play out, let it play out. And it ramped up quite quickly. So I was thinking, oh, like 
maybe I'll give Zach a call and just let him know he works. Um, he can work quite like remotely. So I thought, oh, I better get hold of him before he's out of service or he's gone two hours away and just let him know that I think something might be happening. And he ended up going, oh, I'll just come home and muck around at home just in case we need to head off to the hospital because the hospital I was birthing at was an hour, a bit over an hour from home. So we sort of had to um, plan around that and be a bit mindful of mm. the travel in between. Yeah. So we just bunkered down at home. He mucked around in the shed. I just relaxed in the house and it just kind of carried along. It just nothing, nothing too serious. It just was there, but it was very bearable for quite a while. Um, till about mid-afternoon um, and I had a tens machine which I also highly recommend that thing was incredible like I loved it I know not everyone loves them but definitely worth trying because mm. you don't know if it will if it does help you it's really helpful um, so I'd read a lot to do, um, a lot of people recommend putting the tens machine on really early instead of like leaving it too late if you leave it too late you can't really feel the benefits so I thought oh they're definitely pretty achy now. I'll just put it on early so that I can sort of get a feel for it and kind of get into a bit of a rhythm. I think the sooner I got into a rhythm, the better, the more it would benefit me, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So I put the TENS machine on. It was starting to crank up. It got to about 6, 6.30 and we decided to head um, head over to the other side of town. We were really fortunate to be um, staying at my parents' place, which was five minutes from the hospital. So we had somewhere that I could go and labour that was a bit closer and a bit more it felt a bit safer I suppose without being in in a hospital space I didn't want to I wanted to labor at home Mm -hmm. as long as I could but without running the risk of not making it possible in time or an hour drive in full-blown labor I was not Mm -hmm. (laughs) was not mentally prepared for that so so we yeah we headed over um, and got some dinner on the way and everything was still really manageable it was def- I was definitely feeling it but it wasn't anything it wasn't anything to squeal about um so we yeah we got we got to the house got everything set up I'd gone there a week prior and just sort of set up one of the rooms as like a little bit of like a labor haven I had all my candles and my fairy lights up and everything like that so we just potted along um I got Zach. Zach went to another room and had some sleep because I didn't want him tired and unable to help me. So he went and had some sleep. I tried to get a little bit of sleep in the other room, but I think I got maybe three hours total over the night um, because things ramped up. What night are we yet? Monday night, things ramped up. I got about three hours sleep and I was just sitting sitting on my ball in the TENS machine. And then Tuesday morning, early hours of Tuesday morning, it pretty well, labour pretty well stopped. So it died off just as the sun was coming up and I was so disheartened because it would, it had actually started to get quite painful. Nothing, again, nothing wild, but it was pretty uncomfortable. And then it just stopped as the sun came up and I was thinking, what is going on? Like maybe, maybe this wasn't labour, maybe this was just like a really, really pre- pre-labor thing and it wasn't it was a full, full false alarm and we had lugged ourselves yeah across yeah. town nothing and I was I was I felt really disheartened at that point there's often a natural I'll just come in there Chelsea there's often yeah. natural pauses in labor we tend to think mm-hmm. we, we get we have these ideas about you know growth being a continual upward journey and pro, labor progression being a continual upward journey and um, yeah. Babies growing and all those sorts of things, but actually, it's more like a bit of a roller coaster in mm-hmm. that you know it can go along, and then there can be a little bit of a pause or a stalling or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it, but it, that sort of um, the pause is a real gift in a labour because it helps you to rest. But yeah. unfortunately, our minds get in the way, and we think something's wrong. Yeah, is that what happened to you? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, And, um, yeah, I was just, I just remember thinking, ah, like I kind of had already, I'd I'd sort of got myself into such a good zone that night. Like I was in a really good rhythm. I was coping really well. I was thinking Mm -hmm. baby's going to be here soon. I was excited. And then, and then it sort of stopped and I I felt kind of a bit gypped. I was like, like, I just, I just prepared myself to get into like the hard stuff. Yeah. 
like I just worked, warmed myself up and I was thinking, okay, this is okay. I've got this done the whole mental thing. And I was like, bring it on. And then it stopped. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. And then I, and then I started to like, it felt a bit shaky to me. Mm. But anyway, we went and got some, oh, Zach went and got brekkie actually and brought it back to the house. And we, we just sat around and tried to relax a little bit and just not do too much. Um, and by late morning, they'd, some contractions had come back. So it had sort of started again. Again, it was really pretty mild. Um, and it continued to be mild maybe till about lunchtime. And then it sort of started to pick up again. I was thinking, okay, here we go. Like maybe maybe something might come of this. And it really slowly progressed, slowly progressed. And then it would have been, again, around the same time as it started to get dark, it started to kick off again. So I sent Zach to bed. I jumped in bed. I think that night I got maybe about an hour because within like an hour of me going to bed, they ramped up, ramped up, and they were full on, full on, full on. And I was like, I, in my head, I was just, he was sleeping. I was in the zone. I was in another room and I just felt really, like I had a really good, really good rhythm going. And I thought, okay, this is it. Like I'm in control of these. I had my combs. I, I Funny actually, because in your course, a lot of it is like about, you know, relaxing your body mm-hmm. and going with it. And I had, I did have the combs as a backup. So I had the tans on and I had the combs. And the comb was really handy, but not for like the reason, not, not for how you're usually supposed to use it. Because every time I had a contraction, I'd grab my comb and then try not to squeeze it. Yeah. So I was just holding them in my hands and trying not to let my hands push into the um, bristles. Yeah. So they were us- they were really useful, but I was using them in a, in a not completely opposite way. I was just using that as like a a mental thing in my head to go yeah. don't squeeze these like relax your body like, relax your hands and don't hang on to the combs yeah which worked really well for me so I mean yeah so let me just help people who don't know what Chelsea's talking about the combs uh, you hold them and you're meant to squeeze them during contractions and the way the comb is along the palm of the hand can squeeze certain acupuncture points Mm. So there's a little bit of sense to these, but of course, Chelsea's worked with me and we talk a lot about relaxation and no tension in the body and rolling with birth, not against it. So she's obviously used it as the, um, as just a, a way of um, a, like a mental cue, a mind cue yeah. to do. It to bring my brain to my hands. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then from there it went down. Yeah. So, but just, really just on that too, I think it's really interesting that during the day your labour was really light and yet it ramped up at night. Mm. It, this is mammal stuff. You know, These are, it's a lot of animals tend to birth at night. And why is that? Because they feel safer, safety, yeah. no predators around, that everything's dark, intimate. Yeah. They feel more protected by the, the darkness of night. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Well, on that... So I laboured throughout the night mm. and it was I was count I was timing my contractions and they were around about five minutes apart, but not anything that I couldn't tolerate. Mm. They were painful, mind you. Like it was it was a lot, but um not yeah, it wasn't beyond my capabilities at that point and I still felt quite in control. But as I was looking at the time, and I know I'm not supposed to look at the yeah, time. Yeah, you're not supposed so. to look at the time, <laughs> but you did. But I, and... but I did have a little sneaky peek because it had been such a long process. I was thinking, like, surely this has gone for so long. Like, if I look at the time and get an indication of how long I've been in labour for, it'll indicate to me that, like, you know, it can't be much longer than this. It's got to, yeah. it's got to eventuate at some point. So I looked at the time and it was almost... I think it was like four four thirty or four o'clock or something, and all that told my brain is that the sun's going to come up soon, and that like that just made my stomach sink. <laughs> the, the, the notion the notion of the sun coming up again yep. made me feel ill. I did not want to I did not want to be in that house still in labour with the sun coming up for the second day in a row. For the second day in a row, and yes. this this my darling, I, I this is. 
the biggest trap we can fall into as birthing women. And of course, we're going to go there, Chels, of course, especially after two nights. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of a marathon labor. And that is part of the challenge that we have in labor is when we know how long we've been in labor for, we get into this, how much longer do I have to keep think going thinking? And when we yeah. get into that, we're digging ourselves a hole because that's when our mind gets in the way and starts to interfere. So yeah. were you able to overcome that, Chelsea? That's a really interesting thing. No, I was not. It I woke screwed back you up. over. <laughs> I woke back up and I said, let's go to hospital because if I stay in this house and continue, like I just thought, I know yeah. it's probably like counterproductive, but I just thought, my, well, my contractions were quite close. Mm. So I thought, um, get me in there and maybe I can get in the bath at this point yeah. and keep in the zone, but stay here and stay in the daylight and I feel like it will stop again. Mm. Like if I just stay in like a normal environment, I feel like it will just, my body will just go, oh, daytime, shut off again. Whereas if I went and hid in, hid in a bar, dark bathroom and got into a bath and tried to relax and keep relaxed, mm. it might, I don't know. Maybe I was trying to push it along a little bit probably. I was probably a bit impatient. But I just thought, oh, I just can't do another day mm. of this if it's going to stop again and start again. I just thought, no, bugger it. We'll just go to hospital and see, just see. Because I was really, I was getting really, really exhausted by this point. I had, yeah. I think it's, yeah, about four hours total since Monday morning. And, it, yeah, it was Wednesday morning now. So we went to hospital. We got to hospital about 5.30, so it was still dark. Just, I remember getting out, of the, getting out of the car in the hospital car park and like looking at the sky and, you know, it's just starting to lighten up. You can mm. see the tinge on the horizon. I just thought, just get me in that room before I see the sun. Like I don't want to see the sun. Um, so, yeah, we went we went up, got all set up. My, I had a beautiful student midwife. I was so, so lucky. I think actually she hugely contributed to my experience being a positive one, which I might actually get into a bit more later on. But mm. um yeah, for now, she beat us to the hospital and she'd run the bath already and got all our lights. She'd set the room up for me and got all the lights and everything going. Um, got into hospital, contractions stopped, like fully stopped. There was not one. I think I had I had two contractions in an hour or something like that and it was, <laughs> yeah, and I was just sitting there. I hadn't even got the bath yet. I was just sitting there thinking, what is going on? And um. Yeah, my, my midwife was actually, she was great too. She was like, don't stress about it. Like, this is mm. so normal. It's just your body adjusting to a change of environment. Yeah. Like, you're obviously in your head a little bit too. Just need to chill out, get back in the zone. So I thought, uh, I'll just get in the bath. But I, oh, sorry. They started to sort of amp back up again, still quite far apart but they started to amp back up again. And she watched a few of my contractions. They were strong, but quite a good distance. And she thought, oh, they are really, really strong. So maybe we'll get you in the bath because it has been such a long stint. Maybe you just need a bit of relief in your body to relax. So I jumped in the bath and I was still tolerating it um, and able to, you know, breathe through it. And I was working with it. My body was okay. Within probably half an hour maybe of being in the bath, half an hour to an hour of being in the bath, it went like whoo and proper kicked off again. And it was nice because the door was shut and it was it had all the lights off and there was just a few fairy lights and it was really dark. And it was just um, myself, Zach and our student midwife. So And we had some music playing and it was just really quiet. It's all good. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> It was just um, really quiet and peaceful. And I think at that point, I don't know, my body must have just sort of gone, oh, I'm safe again. And the contractions ran straight back up. And then from that point on, I think it was about five, five and a half hours total mm -hmm. um, in the bath. They just went like zero to hero. And I was really really fighting to work through them at that point like they they got super intense super quick um that had, had to have the the handle the shower handle thing on my back full heat the whole time yeah. and it's only um i birthed at queen bee hospital and the they don't have a birth pool it's just a 
bath. It's a very deep bath and quite a big bath, but it's like mm. a normal, a regular shape. Yeah. So I've got my hands and knees like lengthways in the bath with the hot water on my back. Um, and every time I had a contraction, because the bath isn't very deep, I, <laughs> my face was in the water. So I was sort of like, I'd like throw my head into the water so I could sort of like, I don't know, the hot water on my face. I, was just, I just remember just like trying to like almost blow bubbles into the water. Mm. <laughs> And um, instead of being vocal outside of the water. But, yeah, so. So, Chels, can I ask a question now? So in that five yeah. hours where things really started to ramp up and was probably considered active labour, mm. um, what were the things that you did that helped you to get through that? What did you do with your mind? What were, were the things Zach was doing to help you to deal with that intensity? Um. I went very like inward with that. Like there wasn't much, um, there wasn't a heap of communicating going on um, for the most part outside of contraction. Like I was just basically just like focused and I just had my head, like I said, in the water and I was just trying to think, relax, 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 like nothing at all. Actually, I even like spoke it out loud a few times. I just like was saying to myself like relax, 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 trying to like really like just drop everything and um use the water like I was really focused on the water and feeling like a bit weightless and trying to like really uh I don't know tap into that a bit to try and just like ease my head but um yeah it, it actually got to the point halfway through so yeah I went I did I didn't have any cervical checks yeah um the whole time so I didn't have one on entry into the hospital and I had none throughout my labor Mm -hmm. um so we assume just off my mannerisms <clears throat> and my students midwife my midwives experience with watching women in labor they assume that I was in active labor in the bath so that's interesting you didn't have any cervical checks because a lot of us feel like we actually have to have them and we don't it's always a choice it's not a medical necessity um, and a good midwife can generally tell by the behaviour of a mother where she's up to in labour anyway. So yeah. that's good, Chell. So think in the bath you were probably in very good active labour by then. Yeah. When did you change to second stage where you started to feel the pushing? How did that unfold? Um, so I actually changed positions. I changed and faced back and I was like kind of squatting slash kneeling like in the short side of the bath and then my waters broke right. and my midwife thinks my waters broke at nine centimeters yeah so that's kind of like my indication ish um and then yeah from my waters breaking onward it was just like all hell kind of broke loose and um yeah I got really really vocal at that point and I'm pretty sure that was the only way I was coping coping with it um Found. Sound is a great so, yeah. way to release intensity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, And I just sort of lent into that a little bit and just thought, no, it, it was working for me, so I would just go with it. Um, so there was, yeah, quite a few contractions like that and I was getting a little a little bit um, desperate and a, a little bit stressed at this point. Mm. Um and that was when I started to ask for the for the gas. Yeah. And Zach was really good at going, like, you know, like I know you've got more in the tank and like being really encouraging. And it's funny actually, I didn't get snappy with him at all. It was a really weird dynamic that we had during the birth where typically I probably would have got snappy, but for some reason in labor I it was I was a lot softer towards him for I don't know why. Lucky um, Zach. Yeah, I know, lucky boy. <laughs> he actually said you were really nice. <laughs> he was probably expecting um, worse. <laughs> yeah, actually, I remember apologising to the midwives um, in between contractions because I was so loud. So anyway, and they just they just said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Um, so, yeah, my waters broke and everything really ramped up um, and I was asking for the gas. And I did end up getting on the gas for a little bit, um, but it wasn't. It was it was a really great um, brain thing for me, but it didn't yeah. do anything. It did yeah. nothing for the pain. And actually, yeah, my student midwife said it was just what you needed at the time to give you like a little glimmer of um, 
like like that something was helping the situation because at that point I was just so beyond tired and just feeling really defeated Mm. and it gave me a little something to hold on to that was like oh like something's helping me even though it wasn't doing anything and they actually ended up taking it off me after 45 to an hour because they it was like hindering my pushing so my body started to push and me on the gas wasn't helping because I was more focused on the gas than I was on the pushing pushing. yeah so yeah that wasn't helping at all and they ended up taking it off me and I was pushing and pushing and I was trying to relax my body and waiting for those like natural cues and yeah as I said he could really see the difference between when I was trying to force force a push on like I would like feel a contraction and go like oh I need a push so I was like trying to like bear down and push and he said but when you like kind of relaxed into it he said it was like a very primal like started from my head like my back curved like a cat and like it all it all happened really um like organically and he said the difference in in this in my state in between the two pushes he said it was crazy like you could just see how much more effective letting me letting my body do its own thing and working with it it was so much more effective than trying to actively push yeah. and yeah. often women are coached to actively push and even it, it, there's all there's a lot of con- different ideas around the pushing phase but the idea that we can let our body do it and work with that bearing down sensation as opposed to consciously trying to push, which is what we see on TV all the time. Yeah. Women yeah. going red in the face and all of this sort of thing. But that's not always effective. So that's mm-hmm. interesting how you experienced yeah. and Zach could see the difference in yeah. the effectiveness of it. Yeah. Mm. It was, um, it was a, a really wild feeling. And I could I could even it felt better in my body when I let myself do that with it yeah yes as soon as I like I'd feel a contraction coming and I'd every every part of my body I just said like went relax 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 like let it take over you and that's when I would feel it come on but as soon as I tensed up or started to like anticipate it go or fight it a little bit I'd I'd lose that natural feeling and then would feel Mm. myself like trying to bear down to fight against the pain and it was not doing me any good Interesting. And that's yeah. a really good description of the those two sort of states. Mm. Interesting. So when he started to crown and he was getting closer, tell us about that. So the midwife says, can you feel him? So I put my hand down and I it was the encouragement I think I needed at that point because I could feel him and he was about like one knuckle from mm. crowning. He was so close and it gave me a bit of a um, bit more go. So I was pushing and pushing and pushing and I was trying so hard and nothing was happening. And I, it was getting so beyond intense at this point. Like I was, I was, um, I was really distressed and it was kind of getting a bit past the point of this is mm. within the range of normal. I know the range of normal is really big, but um, yeah, my main midwife came in at that point and she said, I just don't think the bath is working, which I, she was dead right. I just didn't have the room to move and get myself into a better position. I obviously wasn't yeah. comfortable in it. Like I said, it was a small bath. So I jumped out of the bath at that point, almost got to the bathroom door and ended up just squatting on the bathroom floor. And that felt good, yeah. but still wasn't like something just still wasn't quite right. Mm. And what um, they d- tell, tell the listeners what they discovered, he had his little hand up near there yeah, he had so he had his hands he was a double what are they, a double compound presentation I think they called it right. and both hands were up near his head which right. had explained the long labor and the difficulty yeah. of me getting to descend so they had me up on the bed swinging off the bed rails like a monkey yeah. um and trying to do everything I could to get him out they actually thought it was a shoulder dystocia first mm. um and I heard someone, so I had my back to them and I'm swinging there and I've got one leg up and I was literally moving. I can't even tell you how many positions I got into. I was basically crawling around on the bed like an animal, Mm. trying to like wiggle him out, like get myself into a position that he would get out. Um, And I heard like all of the, they hit the duress button and all of these people have come in and I hear someone go say something about a shoulder and my brain just went, "Get, get him out now. 
And I, I just threw, I remember I was on my hands and knees at that point. I just threw my leg up and like did a big like lunge and I was screaming, hanging on to the bed going, get out. (laughs) And yeah, one of the midwives helped assist and pulled him out like a calf, the poor boy. But it was, I think, yeah, it's just just that the hearing that something might have like gone, something was wrong or that like they're about to shit me off for a Caesar or like just that something something was wrong and it was about to um, escalate, Mm. I think was something in my brain just said, you've got to ramp it up a bit now. You've got a bit more in the tank. There's that mother beast. Yeah, everything you've Can I ask you, you know, you said you were writhing around on the bed and you were you lifted your leg up like a lunge. How did you know to do that? Did you were you taught to do that, or did you just feel you needed to do that? I was just doing everything that my body was trying to tell me to do. Like, well I, done, beautifully. Yeah, I jumped up in a squat. I honestly, Trace, I was hanging. That could he thought I was going to rip the two. You know, the bed hand, the bed, the hospital bed yep. handle. He's like, I thought you were going to rip them off the bed. I was <laughs> doing like, I was. Honestly, going mental up there. But, but it, you were, but, but let's let's look at that piece there because I think this is a point I want people to know. When women are free to respond to their labours, when they're not stuck on beds being monitored or things like this, and they're able to respond organically mm-hmm. to what their body's telling them to do, they can assume very interesting positions, putting legs up in the air and all sorts of things. And that yeah. sounds like that's what you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing all sorts. It, I think that's what got him out and he was in mm-hmm. such a compromised position that, yeah, I've spoken to my midwives post-birth and they, they said like most other, like a lot of other cases had I not kind of done what I'd done or yeah. been able to do what I was doing, it's very likely that he wouldn't have come out that way. So He would have ended up being a Caesar. Yeah. Now... As you look at that, Chels, um, you, I, I suspect you feel like a lot of your, uh, oh, sorry, before we go there, tell people how big he was. Oh, so he was 4.47 kilos, so <laughs> four and a half kilo baby. It and he was, he was huge. I remember they, they put him in front of me on the bed and I remember mm. like just looking at him being like, why is it so big? <laughs> it was, I was why like, I was so confused. I was like, looking at him like, that's not my baby. Like, that is massive. He was like, anyway, he was a bit swollen too from birth and whatever. Yeah, but yeah. So he was a up. big, big fellow. So as you look at that, and and I, I know when we talked about it, there was the skill of a midwife who was able to just help guide him along as he started to descend. Um, but and and your ability to respond freely to your labor, and then I think you you feel like your body work was really a part of you being able to push out such a big baby. Is that? Do you yeah, want to talk about that? Because I um, so I did tear. I got a second degree tear, mm-hmm. um, but it was minor enough that I was stitched in in the room, like I didn't yeah, have so. fit or anything. Mm-hmm. And even the way that his hands were, like he was so wide, I didn't re- I didn't get any relief. When he when he came when his head came out, it was just like constant in between the contraction of his head and arms being out, and the rest of his like pushing his body out. Everyone goes, oh, the head comes out, and then next contraction and whoosh, the body just kind of slithers out as well. It was like the whole. It wasn't like the whole, there was no there was yeah. no release, and there was no like getting his body out was as hard as getting his head out. Yeah, um, and. That put that was obviously putting a lot of pressure on my pelvic floor and all of the muscles there, mm. and I haven't had any like issues. I didn't prolapse. I haven't mm. the, the tear. I did tear, but it was pretty minor given yeah, the, the size, size of the boy. Yeah, and the presentation as well. Yeah. yeah. So this kind of flies in the face of a lot of things that um, we get taught. It's I know a lot of women get very fearful about big babies and they assume that they can't birth them. But here's the thing about the pelvis. It expands because it's connected through, you know, ligaments that get softened by a hormone called relaxin and the baby's head molds. Now, the way a baby presents and what part of the head um, is coming down will influence things a lot because the way that head molds will depend on how they're presenting. Mm. 
Um, but having said that, nobody can look at a baby and a woman's pelvis and say, oh, that's not going to fit because it's not it's not fixed. The pelvis isn't fixed. It expands and the baby's head molds. Um, but we're often getting told that, you know, big baby, big baby, you're not going to be able to birth that. And Chelsea's yeah. proven that very differently. My sister-in-law, who's not a big woman at all, she's smaller than you are. And she had a baby of a very similar size too and birthed that baby beautifully. So, yeah. um, and I'm not even sure that she tore. I think it was her second baby, but either yeah. way, Women can birth big babies when they're well presented. And when they're not presented, women will typically assume positions that will help that baby to descend. So I think it's a really important point that we make around it's not the size of the baby that matters. It's the way it's the way they're positioned. Yeah. I always say big babies don't get stuck. It's malpositioned babies that get stuck. Yeah. Little babies can get stuck. Yeah. So, well, even you yeah. say that, Trace, because um, speaking to my midwife, who was a very excellent and experienced midwife, she actually said um, the way that he presented, had he been a smaller baby, I yeah. probably also would have had a Caesar because when he was coming through my birth canal, yeah. he was long enough because he was long. He was um, 57 centimetres. No, sorry, yeah. that's what he is now. He was 54 or 55 centimetres. He was a long baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where he was in my pelvis, he was long enough that he could still be pushed out instead of getting stuck in the dip. Yeah. Whereas had he been a small, compact, short baby presenting like that, he would have gotten stuck. I would not have. There's no chance I would have got him out. Oh, interesting. So, there was a few yeah. things that play. Yeah, there was a few things that play there that mm. kind of made it work the way that it did. But on the big baby thing, there was no indication the whole pregnancy that he was a big baby. None at all. In fact. With his scan, we had a scan at 20 weeks, I think that was our last scan, um, he was on a 60th percentile and it's just really interesting because, you know, you hear quite a few people get really put off when they hear their percentiles and everything mm -hmm. and it's just a good reminder to take that with a grain of salt because like, yeah. people people get sent for, you know, early inductions and things like that so the big babies that come out quite small and yeah. then and then they miss miss a big baby. And it's burst naturally. So yeah. it's just exactly you know, there. It's exactly right. We know that those um, scans are not accurate and I don't know why we keep going off them. And I know mm. many women's induced with that sort of information being presented. Yeah. So it's always something worth ch challenging. Yes. So, Chels, what did you learn about yourself, you legend? <laughs> well, <laughs> I've, I've got a good set of pipes. <laughs> You got a good voice. You still got your voice intact after. Yeah, I was. It, that really shocked me, actually. Like I your just noises. Didn't, yeah, I didn't anticipate. Um, I didn't anticipate how primal I would feel and how much oh. like I would lean into that and um, it feel very natural and comfortable. Mm. Um, and I think that's got a lot to do with feeling safe to do so with my partner and the hospital and the midwives that I had, I think everything combined, I did really feel like I could just completely do what I felt like I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, gosh, you can you can do some pretty wild things. The old woman's body is very incredible. Mm. Yeah. They it's, are, yeah. Yeah. And what would you do? What, what? wisdom would you impart to a pregnant woman um education is so important you know knowledge is power but be really mindful with what knowledge you're consuming and try not to fall down the rabbit hole of you know every every person and their dog's going to tell you their negative story no one likes to tell a good story but everyone likes to tell you something bad that's happened to them mm. And it's completely okay to say oh, I'm not really interested. So like, I'm not really interested in hearing anything negative at the moment. I'm really trying to prep myself positively. I think consume all the positive information. Be really educated. Do the transform your birth course because it's phenomenal. And make sure you take your partner because <laughs> they benefit. And I'm very grateful for it. <laughs> but yeah, if everything you can to just mm. yeah mm. understand your capabilities and not not buy into the uh, the fear yeah, side. The, the people's stories. I, I'll often say to women, when people come at you with their negative stories, just pop your hand up and say, just stop there. 
rather than tell me a story because every story is different, what I'm really interested in is what did you learn that helped you? And then you'll get a different conversation going, a much more constructive conversation. And, yeah, yeah it, it can be very, very helpful. So I think, people, Chelsea's story is a great example where preparation makes a big difference. You don't know what's ahead. You don't know what position your baby's going to be in. You don't know how long your labor's going to be. Chelsea didn't yeah. know any of this stuff. Yet she can look back now and see how the preparation that she did with both the Transform Your Birth course but the body work as well. I think you've given us some great understandings around the power of that. Um, her partner being completely on board, he was a legend. In fact, didn't the midwives just think he was just gorgeous? Yeah, they were all over him. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking real shiny at the end of the birth. <laughs> Good old Zach. Yeah. Um, but with that level of support, those conditions, priming those conditions where a woman can let go, she can be loud, she can climb the bed, she can do all sorts of things yeah. with her legs, having that freedom sets us up for being able to get the best possible outcome with as yeah. little fuss and little intervention as possible. And Chelsea's story has certainly proved that. So thank you, everybody, for listening. We appreciate you um, listening to our podcast. Please rate and review it. It always helps with our rankings and things and getting this really important information out there for women, helping them to birth better, birthing under their own steam, learning more and more about themselves so that you can step through that doorway into motherhood, which is where the real fun begins. Lots of love and we'll see you again next it's week. <laughs> Thanks again, Chels. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe and share this podcast. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. It is a place where you can learn, get support and grow into your role as a parent. Why not take advantage of a special gift for all pregnant women at transformyourbirth.com.au or if you have children, we have a gift for parents also.